Good morning. Do we think that is a laugh? Let me try again. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, thank you, Patty. Good morning. Good morning. Good, Good job, kids. <laughs> Camera can't see you. All right. Where do you, you tell me where you want me to go, and I'll go there. Yeah. Here. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My name is Laura Clemens. If you don't know me, you will by the end of the Congress. Don't worry. Uh, if you haven't heard me, don't worry. You will by the end of the Congress. Even if you're across the street, down the road, you'll hear me. Um, so today we're going to be doing a session that Steve is on hold together called Place Recovery. Welcome to CME 30. Three decades of exciting innovations and we hope today will be no difference from the rest of it. So I'm going to introduce the panelists. Do I just... Yeah. yeah. Alright. Our first speaker today is going to be Camille, which if you were in the plenary, you already had the luxury of meeting her and getting to hear a little bit about her work. Say hi, Camille. Hi, everyone. Good morning, Camille. Good morning. Bye. And then we have Marcus um, teaching us how to deal with very cold weather like this. <laughs> <laughs> and then Steve Muzan is going to come in, and uh, he's used to living down in the Floridian and Alabama weather, so we're both freezing to death in this room. And then me, Elsie Clements. Nice to meet you. If you know me well enough, you can call me Laura, but the rest of you get to call me Elsie. <laughs> Alrighty, so I'll let you kick it off, Camille. Awesome. Um, where do you want her to stand so she can be recorded? Yeah, yeah I'd love to stand. Camille, this is your X marks the spot great, right here. Great. In this area. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Um, Alright, so I guess I'll start off by uh, talking about um, how, just briefly talking about how my journey of, of bringing together people for place initiative led to the incredible project that's come out of, um, of place initiative that Baxter has been spearheading, uh, the receiver places, um, the climate receiver places project. Um, but first, I, I want to um, piggyback on what Rick was saying in the plenary about how it really does, you know, what, uh, you know, some of the discussion that we had that you know, we are part of, this move, of, the, of the larger movement, CNU, but it takes one person to, you know, to feel something and, and speak up. And with that, people will gravitate towards you because they see your passion and they want to help. And I think that is such an important, an important part about CNU as an organization. And it, I think that anyone here can, can thrive if they put their mind to something because there's, Everyone here will support you. Um, so with that, I I will say that, um, that I, Laura wanted me to speak about a little bit about that journey, but I, I will talk about, a little bit about the project that we've been working on. Uh, there's, like, as I said, the Climate Receiver Places Project and Place Initiative. If you want to learn more, please stop by the booth. We would love to have you on board to work with us. It is very important. It's a very important um, initiative. And we've been working, and I've been working with with Laura and Steve on this. Um, and so, um, yeah, uh, basically, um, I guess with that, we we have begun identifying geographies across the country that will be um, receiving places for climate refugees to migrate to when um, when things get ugly in their hometown. And um, this is a, a national effort that we. Are, are working on working on and we hope that we bring in as many people within CMU and outside the organization to work on this for you know for a lifetime ahead um, and yeah uh, I guess that's gonna be my spiel. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right Good job Camille. Okay cool. Okay this is for you. And slides are yeah you just so I need to send it to the podium. Uh, yeah, don't mind. Okay. I do not mind, Steve. All right. I usually don't have notes. Um, I hate having notes, but uh, I've put together a, 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 a smushing of different slides, so I'm going to try to make eye contact with you guys. <laughs> and not use my notes, but we'll see. Um, so, again, my name is Marcus King. Um, um, hopefully, you'll see a common theme and thread between all the things that uh, uh, the four of us have been talking about. Talking about uh, from a different, uh, perhaps, perspective, uh, coming from different scenarios, 
but hopefully you'll see some synergies between the strategies that we'll talk about in terms of this idea of place recovery. This thing called place recovery can be defined in a, a lot of in a variety of different ways. It can take on a lot of different um, 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 uh, sort of a attributes, uh, but again, there's some common threads between all of them. Um, there's a little Wait, oh, no, that's not on the slide. I didn't. Okay. You know what? Quickly go through those. I, I thought this I had forever. Okay, no, but, um, make it work. Yeah. Teamwork makes the dream work. You know, go on. That does indeed make the dream work. That's why I have this all lined up. Here we go. Those are just my slides. Yeah, I know. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so. Wrong <laughs> That's a good time. Okay, so this is what we're about to all right. Joe knows this very well. So I want to start with uh, where would be to start with uh, this idea of the, uh, this investment and, and talk about how we got to where we are. And I want to I don't want to belabor the point because I think a lot of you guys know this stuff. Uh, but these first three slides, I think, and, and the best of my ability to summarize how we got to this place of um, uh, disinvesting in cities. And I think to talk about how we disinvested in cities, we can talk about what we invested in, right? So what did we invest in? And this is no, by no means exhaustive, uh, but it's sort of like the greatest hits of like what we invested in the 21st, the 20th century, right? So um, chief among them, uh, R1 Zone. Um, or um, as I like to call it, zoning by use and the user. Um, the use and the user. The second thing we invested in uh, were personal automobiles, um, uh, highway system to go along with that. Um, and then um, um, at the top of that list, um, um, one can argue, is the, the definition of a home as a single use detached structure and only that. All right. Those are the things that you know, uh, sort of the cornerstone of what we invested in the 21st century and have played a large part in the quality of the environments that we live in today, okay? So I think these next three slides just talk about, you know, um, they only look at two cities, but this sort of happened across the entire country. Um, and full disclosure, these are slides from, from a class that I teach at the University of Maryland um, that, that talks about uh, 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 mapping sort of data um, in terms of the morphology of, of, of the American place. So this is the city of Atlanta. This was the, uh, on the left is the 1922 zoning code uh, that didn't get passed, um, um, but it has some unique characteristics of it. Uh, all the purple is R1 zoning, or as it was called before, it was codified white district, okay? Everything that's blue is the R2 zone, the color district. Everything that was R3 is an undefined district, which essentially just became a sort of buffer zone for, for the R2 and the, R, and, the, uh, and the R1 district. On the right, you have the HLOC map. This is, e, this is the HLOC map, the red line map is colloquially called um, um, a residential security map uh, made by the HLOC in the 1930s. And what happens when you overlay them, um, you begin to see some stark, some, some stark contra, um, um, overlaps, right? You see that the R1 district, or as it was called before, the white district, overlays with uh, these areas that are hatched on the HLFC map, the residential, residential security map, maybe yellow, primarily blue and green. If you know anything about the redlining maps, blue and green are the highest value areas in the city. Right? On the contrast, um, places where uh, people of color uh, and indeed other undesirables, as the, the maps defined in their, in their um, in the pamphlets, undesirables being um, certain immigrant groups that you know um, uh, that that were deemed to be um, nuisances. They fall directly in line with red line areas um, or red hatched areas, which just so happen to be where uh, the lowest value land is and or um, um, essentially telling the federal government do not, uh, 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 or telling banks, the federal government telling banks not to give investment or loans in those areas, right? So we see this stark correlation. In, in addition to that, um, as I mentioned, we invested um, not only in this sort of zoning mechanism, this single use, single structures um, um, development patterns, but we also developed, um, uh, we invested in vehicles and the infrastructure to support them. Um, and 
using the HLOC maps and zoning as a guide for where we uh, we place that infrastructure. And lo and behold, it just so happens to be where people that look like myself lived. Uh, this is a series of maps in Detroit, uh, Paradise Valley, sort of heart uh, in, the, in the core of Detroit, it's zones red. Uh, just so happened to be where, I, I might have said this um, in the virtual scene last year, but my grandfather uh, started a business there. That business got uh, uh, repossessed through eminent domain, destroyed. I-75 sits exactly where that my, my grandfather's shop uh, once stood, taking away that equity and um, um, and his dreams, that, that's what equity that, that he put in, right? So why, why does this even matter? Um, um, I, I think the connection with zoning in America and, and race is, is not mentioned enough. Um, yes, it was about protecting rights, uh, property rights, but uh, uh, the history that doesn't get talked about is that it has a unique structure and genesis in racial motivations. Um, uh, there's a lot of quotes that I, could, that I could spew off at you, but I think this one sort of says it all. Uh, this is from a, a 1920s administrative law expert um, who's talking about the Buchanan decision, which was a decision that essentially made, um, at the Supreme Court, that made it illegal to specifically mention race in a zoning code, right? But what this, uh, this law professor was stating that there are other mechanisms that essentially do the same thing, mainly economic and policy driven, right? And that's where we sort of see the, uh, uh, the, the development of zoning here in America. It doesn't specifically say race, but it essentially does the same thing by implementing these, uh, these racial and, and, and policy standards. All right, so enough of that. So um, I, I often quote a lot of pop culture uh, quotes, quotes in, my, in my lectures, mainly to get a lot of my kids to pay attention. <laughs> um, um, but this is from a, a hip hop artist named Drake, um, and I, I like this quote. Um, it, it can mean a lot of things, but I think it, it, it relates a lot to the development um, um, perspective uh, here in America. We like to go from zero to 100 real quick. We like to go from nothing to the mountaintop in an instantaneous moment, right? And this has nothing to do with um, um, you know, what we were just talking about in the plenary in terms of like acting uh, very quickly, but it talks about a sort of, it really talks about building equity along the way, slowing down just a little bit so that we don't, <clears throat> excuse me, um, so that we don't um, uh, dis uh, potentially disenfranchise uh, those individuals that are, that are actually living there and calling home, really trying to nurture place. So instead of going from zero to 100, um, um, uh, you'll hear me and some of my colleagues talk a lot about this idea of incremental development, right? How can we grow organically? Um, which is, what you really think about is really how cities for the longest time grew in the first place, right? And I make this correlation between the individual and then the city as, a, as, a, um, as two microcosms that are on similar trajectories, right? The ability to grow proportionally. You know, at the individual level, um, theoretically, as I grow older, my family uh, expands, perhaps you get married, perhaps you get kids, perhaps your, 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 um, your parents are aging. Um, they, they need to live with you for whatever reason. Uh, hopefully, as you um, as you grow older and you develop and you become more successful, your your finances improve as well, um, and the development of your asset should grow along that proportional trajectory as well. Cities grow the same way organically. That allows you to sustainably um, and, and organically grow that place, as a, as opposed to this the, this idea of you know um, uh, supplanting something in a place where nothing exists and and sort of inorganically. Um, uh, um, defining this place. I love this image. This is a, um, 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 an image of Detroit, which, uh, an image of a building in Detroit, um, which I think alludes to this idea of, of growing small. Um, this is a single parcel. Um, uh, a dude built a house in the front, and he, he must have been the, the, the most important entrepreneur on the block because he's got like five businesses. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, he, but he was allowed to, he, he, he was afforded the opportunity for this to happen. Right? And who knows why he developed all these different businesses on this parcel. Perhaps he didn't even run them all, right? But he had the opportunity to adapt his, his, um, his family circumstance um, through his private property over time, right? Small parcels um, growing organically, sustainably over time, right? Um, I, I talk about precedent a lot because I think the uh, history can teach us a lot. Um, um, this, this idea of being modern, for the sake of modern, I think is, is a fallacy. Um, you can be modern while taking some of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, 
the, the lessons that we've learned over, over the past millennia, really, uh, and ushering them into, into the 21st century. And then this idea of, um, um, again, developing organic um, is not sort of for the layperson, right? Um, I showed this image of Mount Vernon, uh, which is uh, George Washington's plantation. Um, his house was grown organic. This is, a, this is a uniquely American sort of idea, right? The idea of coming to the quote unquote new world, having your property, your parcel, um, George Washington himself, I think it was his great great grandfather that uh, that originally owned the land, built the first house on it, passed it down to his father. His father <laughs> put an addition on it. Then George Washington got it. He expanded it, and then so on and so forth. Right. So this idea of growing, starting small, growing organically, um, um, has a lot of lessons that we can take um, um, as we begin to look at places that are that have been disinvested in. Well, there's nothing there, we have small parcels and you need to grow it um, uh, over time. So just would quickly run through these last two slides. Uh, I've sort of been working on this idea called grow as you go, right? The ability uh, for somebody to start small uh, with a, you know, a small increment, perhaps it's a cottage of some sort, um, 800, you know, thousand square feet, probably up to higher end, right? But being able to add these addendums easily uh, I think that's a key point to sort of press, um, which sort of caused and cause to play a lot of this, the, the city um, engagement there. But this ability to add these addendums as you go, as your lifestyle requires. Um, and they can take, this, this is just one example, right, of sort of developing a house, right, but you can, you know, you can interchange uses. Uh, I think it should be uh, for largely use agnostic. Uh, but this idea of having the ability to grow small and then grow um, and adapt to uh, global circumstances. So uh, I'll, I'll show these next three slides are just a couple of uh, excerpts from a project I'm working on with Eric Cromer. I think I saw him coming here. Right over here. We're talking more at 1245. So we're talking more at 1245. Yeah. 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 Yep. <laughs> but uh, but uh, one of the things we're working on, Kyle, 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 a land bank, Kyle, Kyle. Kyle. Okay. Yes, in, uh, in, in Ohio, um, is this idea of uh, first taking parcels uh, that are already pretty small, but uh, potentially making them even smaller. Um, so these are a couple of schemes that we sort of created. Um, um, uh, having these sort of small format houses uh, on them, right? Uh, but again, embedded in that, you know, you have the ability to, you know, get to these sort of, you know, quote unquote, finished, um, iterations by starting small. So on the, on the bottom is a house that you know, they already know how to build, the land bank already knows how to build. On the top is a prototype that we're sort of massaging right now. Um, and it's a, um, uh, I think it's, it's, it's actually based off of one of Eric's uh, model houses, a small two-story uh, house, um, which you could add a guest suite to. Um, and then perhaps if you would like, you can add a garage uh, if you would like. Um, although I think a lot of people use garages for storage and not storage of their cars, um, 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 but that could be argued. And then a pro prototype that I'm sort of working on uh, myself is you know this sort of cottage series that it, that sort of adapts in a linear fashion. Again, you have a primary residence in front. Um, you you have a, a couple of accessory structures in the back. Um, the, the caveat here, um, and again we'll talk more about this in our 1245 session on, on land banks. Um, the ability, the ability to do this easy uh, is extremely important, meaning that we, meaning that we need to partner with cities and um, um, to be able to get these things permitted and, and move through the process much quicker. This can be done with plan sets um, 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 at, the, at the architect level, right? Uh, but more importantly, at the city level, pre-approved plan sets, and again, we'll talk a lot about a, a lot about that in our land bank. Um, and so wrapping up here, you can also transpose this to the, uh, the block and neighborhood scale. It's a project that I worked on with Steve uh, and Susan uh, in, in Fairfield, Alabama, that essentially just talks about the same, same, same thing, taking these small vacant blocks um, and then using these small increments to build up to what is the envisioned um, sort of final version of that. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll leave, it, leave it there and I'll pass it over to Steve. I'm gonna give that Thanks, to you. is where you're gonna get little pieces of different ways in which places can recover. Um, what a lot of what informed this session was the fact that um, new urbanists have been working for three decades to create tools, tools that can be used. And Hattie has used the, the phraseology about a, a toolbox. 
And you, any of us that at home, you know, when you, when I went to college, I started off like my dad gave me like a set of tools and he gave me the basics, right? I needed a hammer and I needed a flathead screwdriver and I needed my Phillips head and, you know, and over time, every time I've moved and I've moved over 80 times, every time I move, I need different tools. Like maybe the bed that I'm putting together has a different set of tools and so I pack those in. And the next thing comes and I pack those tools in. And so now I have a really extensive toolkit that I can use to fix pretty much anything that breaks or to modify the things that I don't like the way that they are. And so the way that we're leading into this session is to think about the way in which all of the 30 years of the tools that the CNUers have been coming up with can be aggregated together and you can use them to recover specific places, whether that's um, a parking lot that you want to see retrofitted for housing and services with liner buildings, whether that is a major manufacturing facility that has gone under and now you've got a big giant mall or you've got a big giant factory or shipping area that you don't know what to do with how to break it into pieces, or whether you're working on really tiny small scales at the way to have a house and build all of the pieces onto it. So it's thinking about what we can do to send you away with the most ways to think about different ways to use that flathead screwdriver and not originally the way that it was necessarily conceptualized, because times change and the things that you need to build and the neat things that you need to fix you couldn't have imagined when you got that tool in the first place. So thanks Marcus for that, which that was telling you about the incremental tiny ways to repair places like uh, a Detroit where you have a lot of vacancy, you have emptiness. And so how do you bring those pieces together? The next thing uh, that we're gonna talk about is another version of when there is nothingness there. Um, I work in disaster recovery. I have been working in disaster recovery for 10 years now, and um, I love that we are finally, after 10 years of me being cantankerous and screaming and shouting that disasters are happening every day, that finally, 10 years later, new urbanists are fully on board and now we've got a plenary panel about it. So I am <laughs> super stoked about that. And I'm super stoked that finally my colleagues at CNU, I'm hearing some other voices other than mine because everybody gets tired of hearing me be the only one talk about it. So I'm excited to say that Steve is on, instead of me, is going to be talking about disaster recovery today um, with a disaster that hit the Bahamas, a place that he had worked in for a very long time. If you've ever read any of his numerous books, if you haven't, go on Amazon and order books right now. Um, and so I'm gonna hand it over to Steve. Thanks, Laura. Or, sorry, thanks, LC. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of tools, um, what, what, what we discovered in the process of kind of looking at, at these different types of place recovery uh, is, is the fact that, that uh, actually there's a lot of specific tools that we've been developing over the last uh, decades, last few decades, that, that actually work in these different types of recovery, uh, not just uh, not just one. Now that, that's a great thing because of the fact that, that it, uh, it makes it a whole lot more efficient. We don't have to relearn, completely relearn recovery from disaster recovery uh, to straw recovery, for example. And, and so, because a lot of the tools uh, work very much the same way. Now, you, one thing you'll notice here, if you, if you look at all these, you say, wait, wait, where's the transect? Well, the transect's not on there. Some of the big picture uh, uh, tools like the transect and like the regional green, you won't find on here. These are more specific things that, uh, that have to do with the recoveries of the various sorts. But in every case, they, they all start out tactically. Uh, that, that's, that's the beginning point. And, uh, and then they go from there. And some of these are, are more useful in, in one type than another, but, but they, all, they all span uh, the spectrum just to varying degrees. Um, so there's, and there's various uh, starting points of place recovery. In disaster recovery, you might have something just catastrophic like what happened when Dorian uh, hit Marsh Harbor in the Bahamas, uh, what, two and a half years ago now where, I mean, it literally was sitting there with, with gusts of up to 225 miles an hour for two days. It was a tornado sitting on the city for two days. I mean, they called it a hurricane, but in reality, it was the strength of, a, of, of a, what is it, F4, I guess it was, tornado. And so in that particular case, then it's basically raw land. You know, I mean, there's nothing left. And, or in, in the cases of, of uh, you know, other things less severe than that, because that, that, that's, in all of recorded human history, that, that was the worst uh, 
hurricane ever uh, for that length of time uh, in a place. And then the, uh, the next step is if it's a less severe uh, a disaster, then it can, you can have damaged buildings and infrastructure and you, and you start building from that point. Now, community recovery, where you're talking about not individuals that are fleeing uh, and, and they just they, they go where best they can to a, a receiver city and just find a home, but you know, there's cases through time of entire communities that move in mass. There was a, I uh, went to school called Ball State University, Muncie, Indiana, and uh, there was a, and I don't know the name of the, of the town, but there was a town in Tennessee that in the 1930s, uh, things got so tough that they, they literally picked up in mass, and most of what is now Muncie uh, came from Tennessee. And, and so, so we're talking about when, when, there's, when, when there's actually moving more than one, one family, uh, but groups of time that, that uh, uh, you know, that, so the community recovery, that's what that entails. And, and that can actually start with raw land. In other words, you, you, you say, well, let's, let's build our town here adjacent to this existing city. Uh, you know, but it could, could be this greenfield, uh, or it, it could be, or you could start with what amounts to uh, damage to buildings and infrastructure, or disinvested areas, or it could be uh, just, you know, a sprawl that you're, that you're kind of colonizing that, that needs to be Actually, that's a bad term, but anyhow, that, that, that you're, uh, anyhow, that, that, that you're, uh, you know, so, so there's various starting points of community recovery. Then, when you get into disinvestment recovery, that's, you know, that could be either disinvested uh, buildings and infrastructure, that's the primary uh, uh, condition that you'd be starting with, or it could be just what I'm calling inappropriate buildings and infrastructure that's sprawl. And of course, that's where sprawl recovery uh, all occurs because you, so you have various starting points with these, but, uh, but that's, uh, but anyhow, I just wanted to get, get a picture. Okay, this is uh, Marsh Harbor. It's, it's, or that's a, a plot of land in Marsh Harbor I'm illustrating this with, and it, it's a, uh, it's a ruined uh, uh, marina. And so the recovery phases uh, are that, that we've worked out is that, local and immediate, and then the beginning of the community, and then what Laura calls when the hammers show up, and then you uh, build local community at the beginning of a local economy, because it's not just about infrastructure, it's about people and culture as well, and then uh, uh, the beginning of storm hardening, and then you continue it and you complete it. So just a quick picture, local and immediate uh, is here, the beginning of the community is here, and then the hammers show up here, and let's go back and, and just real quickly look at what these pieces are. This is just what people could scrap, you know, scrounge together, a couple of tarps uh, stuck up on poles to get some shelter uh, to at least begin the process. And in the beginning of the community, uh, actually, you you start with the working square. You know, there will be a working square and a living square, but you start uh, with the working square. You you plant the flag because that means we're coming back. You know, until you do that, it's it's. Uh, I mean, that, that that's a that's a similar point. You you have to. Be concerned with you know that this is the cookhouse and food and water and and so to get those uh, distributed uh, as quick as possible. Now, what should happen any place that has to deal with with uh, natural disasters? You often have uh, the solar sheds stocked up somewhere that you can then take those out there. And the idea is if you can sit down and and, and plug something electrical in and actually have power, <clears throat> but that. You know, you don't want to build that after the storm. You want to have it sitting there waiting. Hammer show up. A few things to look at here. Here's, here's now the working square where some of the buildings are are starting to be. So when hammers do show up, then you can build stuff that's a little more, uh, a little less ephemeral than just army tents. And and then then the living square uh, is on uh, on this side. And. Uh, then that's just a view from the other side. Again, the, the, the idea being that this is the one place that you can come in the day, uh, at the end of the day, and, and, and have a meal, and also where announcements are made, and as soon as possible, begin to recover the culture of the place. Get, get some useful instruments back into the place where people can you know, <coughs> play and sing, and you know, until you do that, it's just, it, it's just uh, it, if there's no cultural recovery, then, then it's, it's, a, it's a bad place to be. So I believe, yep, that's all. That's it.
So, Steve, if you haven't had the pleasure of knowing Steve for as long as I have, um, or longer for many people that go to see you, Steve is really brilliant at seeing patterns, at being able to define patterns, and that's what his books are all about, is the patterns. And he can quickly synthesize and determine what these patterns are and how best to share that out. And so in doing, uh, in the work that I've been doing in disaster recovery, what Steve has been synthesizing is the 30 years of seeing you and how the tools can be applied to my world, which is disaster recovery. And what you saw in the plenary is, it's your world. So how many of you in here have been directly yourself or indirectly by a family member or loved one affected by a natural disaster? Raise your hands. How many of you feel like, keep your hands up, how many of you feel like that you are being impacted by climate change in some way, shape, or form? This is something we can all agree on. What almost 100% of us are impacted by climate change, i.e. in my world, again, I work in red states where we don't use those worlds. Because whether or not you believe in carbon sequestration or that we caused it, what we do believe in is rain and tornadoes. And I don't know that if you've been keeping up with what's been happening the past two days and what's happening today, tornadoes and rain, devastation, Alabama, Georgia, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, all in the past three days, devastated by tornadoes and rain. And I keep getting alerts on my phone every few minutes. There's another flood alert. There's north of tornado alert. What that means to me, very depressingly so, growth industry, baby, I'm never going to run out of work because there are so many disasters and there are so many opportunities. And as depressing as that is, I told Kay I was telling her in the, in the session, I was like, this is so exciting. Look at all this death and destruction. There's nothing but opportunity here. Yay. So that's the, the positive optimism in me is that yes, we do have an opportunity to do some really great things. So uh, I have rebranded, which is why you hear me telling people to call me LC. Um, and my company has transitioned from Collaborative Communities, which I started 12 years ago, um, which has become a foundation because it turns out that I was operating like a foundation all along. Um, and so I have transitioned to actually um, being coached that I needed to run a business that earns money, which is apparently what people do. So I have started Force of Nature Solutions, LLC. Um, I have um, hired a brand manager, Madeline, wave to everyone. I have hired my own 22-year-old to help me figure out how to do all this social media stuff. She's been doing really wonderful because she takes all of the things that are inside of my head, which turned out to be like five or six companies that I was running in my head and three nonprofits and writing 14 books, none of which were outside of my body, and is helping me extricate all of that so that there can be lots more people in the world that understand this sort of thing. We started an initiative. Um, these things span from disaster recovery, but all of the equity that's wrapped into disaster recovery. So we started an initiative called Renters with Roots. How many people live in a community where renters are seen as less than important of homeowners? How many people have ever been the renter that was considered less than a homeowner? I am still in my community a renter by choice, and I am considered less than when I sit down to dinner next to my friends because they are homeowners. They care more about their neighborhoods, they care more about their school systems, they apparently care more about everything than I do simply because I rent, which is very odd to me, but it is, of course, it's got its patterns of historic systemic, systemic racism. The beautiful thing is that now it's transcended race and we have plenty of brown and black communities that also do not want renters. So uh, the next thing that I've got going on is there's the foundation that I've started and then I've got this um, series of books that we're trying to get out of my head into the real world. Um, which has helped a lot to learn what zines are, which instead of writing a big giant book like Jerry wants to do, which weighs 77 pounds, I can do a zine that's only like 10 pages long, and that's still taking me forever to get out of my head. So the zines um, are about the doer's guide. I am an activist. I am a rabble rouser. You will hear me heckling from the back of the room in many sessions or at the front of the room like I did this morning. Mm -hmm. And so, woo that's right. Because for the past 10 years I've been coming here and I've been saying the same thing. Where are the people that don't look like us? Where are the people that are like the communities that I've been working in? Because I hear every day, well, why do people keep rebuilding and moving into disaster recovery type of places? Well, because they didn't start out there by choice generationally. So a lot of the things that I do are all kinds of pieces of new urbanism and equity and race 
and redlining, which by the way is a uh, Friday session at 1.30. You can come to redlining 2020 or 2022. We have yet to decide which one is the correct. Uh, you can call it either way. So um, the way that I got into disaster recovery is I was an activist, I've been a school teacher, I've worked in the arts, I've done a lot of different things. I've worked at a car washing, a vet clinic, a medical uh, facility, you name it, and I've done it, that's on my business card, I can do that, you need to know about it, and I know some aspect of it. I got into disaster recovery because of this. I mean, this is one of the 67 of this that happened in one day in Alabama in 2011. It was a pretty shitty day, I'm gonna be honest. I got out of bed that morning, I was helping pull together a nonprofit fundraiser, I didn't think anything about anything, they'd all, the weather people had been telling us all day it was gonna be the worst day in recorded history, but nobody paid attention because they always say the sky is falling and so we quit listening. Um, around about um, five o'clock, right at rush hour, um, we had an outbreak. It was the largest tornado outbreak in global history within that expanse of time. Within a couple of hours, most of the 67 tornadoes hit. So this is one of the largest ones. Nothing behaves the way it was supposed to. Just like Hurricane Sandy, which was not in fact a hurricane, it was a superstorm. This was not a tornado. It may look a little bit like a tornado. It was called a supercell. It was a mile and a half wide on the ground. It started on the ground in Mississippi and it got done being on the ground in Georgia. It never left the ground. And something that's a mile and a half wide, uh, these are photographs, a lot of them that I took myself. This is what the state looked like at the end of the day. We had many small communities throughout the state of Alabama that the number one thing that they wanted after the tornadoes was body bags. Tornadoes are not like flood events. Tornadoes carry with them death and destruction. That carries with it a whole hell of a lot of trauma. Most of the people in the state of Alabama have trauma that has never been treated from what happened this day. It hit universities yesterday. Mississippi State University was hit by a tornado. There were two colleges hit yesterday by a tornado. It is really hard when tornadoes hit because it doesn't just affect nursing homes where people are ready to go on their sunny journey in the future. Tornadoes are really awful. They cause a lot of death and destruction. But the great news is, back to the optimist, is hey, it's a lot of opportunity because when your entire state is flattened, most of it wasn't that great anyway. We have a lot of sprawl, we have a lot of things that weren't in the right place. So floods do us, floods, tornadoes, any types of disasters like this, they're kind of doing us a favor. Because if you drive around as a new urbanist, you're like, these places are pretty shitty. I wish we could do something about it. Guess when you can do something about it? When it's all knocked down and you need to rebuild it. The unfortunate part is that we are rebuilding it over and over and over and over again. So if you've been in this, uh, one of my sessions before, you don't get to answer this. Um, let's see, how many federally declared major disasters do we have each year on the order of magnitude of who thinks like each year you have more than five disasters? More than 10, more than 50. We have a major disaster declaration one every week. That means that between 30 and 60 counties somewhere in America is impacted by a disaster. So there's a lot of opportunity. I took this photograph, this was Alabama. A lot of opportunity to rebuild. One in 10 are affected, one in 10 properties, residential properties. That's a lot of property opportunity right there. How many people wish that there was more opportunity to transform places? Guess what there is? These guys, who knows who these guys are, yeah? They are good friends of ours, I'm sure. We love them, no speaking on politics, obviously. Um, so the reason I've got these two handsome fellows up here is to use them as an example of two people that do not believe that federal money should be expended in disasters until, guess what happened? A disaster. And it turns out that they're big fans of federal money as soon as the disaster hit. Um, so what do we do about this? Because I've been, um, working in disaster recovery now for 10 years. I started out as a volunteer, unaffiliated. I ended up being banned uh, by the federal government from volunteering because apparently I'm way too effective to be involved in anything. Then they couldn't get rid of me that way, so they hired me to work for FEMA, which did not go well, I have to say. And uh, after working for FEMA, I ended up working for New York, New York State Homeland Security holding FEMA accountable. That went way better. That has been, holding <laughs> FEMA accountable is way more fun. 
So to date, I still, just last week, I had FEMA attempting to ban me from yet another meeting. It's like the, the thing. So when people say like, oh, you're related to FEMA, I'm like, I just hear FEMA personnel like cringing every time I get associated with FEMA. Mm -hmm. So um, disaster recovery reform is my shit now, right? I've gone from like advocating for a lot of different things and I've gone all the way up to, now what I'm focused on is I'm going to reform the federal government. That's what I think I'm gonna take on now. Yeah, right? Why not? Let's just do it. If we can reform what a, a strip mall is, surely we can take on the federal government. I mean, if they were if they were so unnerved that they banned me from volunteering when I didn't even know what I was doing, guess what I can do 10 years later? Make their lives miserable. <laughs> exactly. So the bipartisan act, the reason I brought this up here is I was like, you know, we can't all get on the same page when something affects all of us. Yeah. Who hates daylight savings time? I mean, let's, let's get rid of this. Guess what? Republicans and Democrats, they all agree as well. So it's proof positive that we can come together on issues that affect all of us. Well, we have issues that affect all of us. And with new urbanism, we have a number of obstacles that we run into. So I've been driving around in a, in a tour bus with you know 30 new urbanists, and I've been doing this for a number of years now, and I just got off of that bus late last night. And so I've been asking, like, what are the biggest obstacles that you're running into to making awesome places where you live? One, if you saw in the plenary, time. Time is the number one thing that we do not have anymore. We do not have any more time. I do not have time to wait 30 years to build cool shit. Okay, I don't have that kind of time. I'm in a hurry. I need to get going. Disasters are happening. I am working in Harvey recovery. Does anyone remember how long ago Harvey was? 2012? No, nope. 2017, 2017? Uh, yeah, 2017, 18, 19, 21, 22. That's, we're going on five years here, people. We're at four and a half years. I'm just starting to get sticks in the ground for the disaster recovery housing that I got $30 million to rebuild Texas small communities for. Let me assure you what is not effective. Five years until a house is rebuilt, you are really screwed if you are waiting for that house. And this has been going on for decades. Zoning, urgency, codes, funding. You want to overcome some obstacles? Get a disaster. Here's the kind of opportunity that is proposed with disaster. Steve, tell them where it is. Yeah, this is in Barcadero Freeway in San Francisco. That's, most of y'all remember the, the uh, World Series earthquake that took this down? When, most when, of us do not remember that. Okay, good. <laughs> so, some of y'all do. People my age do. People are age dumb. Okay, but, but what happened is, is when, when this came down and it was, it was transformed uh, into the Grand Boulevard, I don't, I, I don't remember the number of how many tens of billions of dollars of real estate value were, was created along the boulevard. It was almost worthless land uh, uh, beside this double-decker freeway uh, beforehand, but it was a lot of money that was created by that disaster. Thank you, Steve. So here's the beautiful thing. You got big giant pieces of infrastructure and there's gonna be some other great uh, Black Caucus sessions. So shout out to the Black Caucus for doing some. Finally, we're getting the conversations that we need to be having about redlining and what if this shit doesn't work out, we need to get out of these highways that we want. If you're having trouble bringing down a highway, hopefully you're in a high, uh, you know, earthquake district. That would make it convenient. Or maybe you get a fire. The thing is to plan for what you need to be doing when you get rid of that really bad day. Because the federal government is a function of giving you time to really think about what you want to do. So you need to be able to snap to action. That's great. We're new urbanists. We can snap to action really quickly. We can know what to do. So this is my thing, right? Activism. Activism. Who in here considers themselves an activist, Kate? Raise that hand up high, girl. Yes, girl. We need all of us to see ourselves as activists, right? How many in here consider themselves advocates? I advocate for something. Everybody, right? It's a safer space to be an advocate than an activist. Activism is like something like you've got to take to the streets. The great thing is, these days, Steve, right? We can just take to our keyboards. We don't even have to take to the streets. We don't have to get our big booties off the couch. We can just click, click, click away with our activism. So what do I need you guys to do? Well, I have specific things that I'm trying to do, you know, overhaul the federal government. And I was kind of thinking, if I personally, as this little southern girl from Alabama, raised in a little single white trailer on the top of a mountain, if I can so thoroughly, by myself, accidentally, unnerve the federal government such that they ban me from volunteering in a major disaster, what could we all do if we got together? 
What if we did it strategically and we used all of the information that I've garnered over my 10 years of ways to unnerve the federal government? And I have a lot of tactics. So we have social media now, and with the zine that I'm doing, the Doer's Guide books, um, we have this thing that uh, that's about doer's demands, right? The thing about reforming the, the FEMA disaster recovery system is that no one, everyone knows it's broken, but nobody really understands from the president all the way down how it works. Because FEMA's hidden underneath Homeland Security with a veil of secrecy. And no one really gets, like, how does the money be expended? Who in here thinks FEMA does a terrible job with housing recovery? Housing recovery is 10% of what FEMA is doing terribly. They are doing 90% more bad shit than you know of, okay? So the reason that these doers' demands are important to me is because with a hashtag and with an at sign, we can all raise our voices up and we can say, hey, this isn't just a problem for that one neighborhood of poor black folks that happen to be flooding and are just not uh, educated enough to understand how to work the system. This is a something that is broken no matter how wealthy you are, no matter how highly educated you are, no matter how prosperous your city are. Rural Alabama is being screwed equally to New York City. So the good news is that there's a lot of equity in that, right? We're all being screwed over. FEMA took on the Catholic Diocese of New York. You just don't do that sort of thing, right? So in regards to the doer's demands, my demands are A, accurate risk maps. If you guys are relate, relying on the NFIP maps, don't ever mention an NFIP flood map again. The former FEMA administrator came out in public on television and said, he admits 80% of those maps were completely inaccurate and useless. 80%. Until five years ago, FEMA was not even mandated by legislation to think about future weather changes. They only looked backwards. So put those flood maps aside. I say my hashtag is, if you wanted to app on your social media, get your phones out because we're about to do a little game. Phones out, phones out, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Phones out, computers out. So I want you to at me whenever you have one of these doers demands because for the books that I'm writing, these zines, I want to make sure that I'm capturing what is most important to Americans. And you're like the best Americans because you're the ones in the room with me right now. Uh, I'm sorry, I should not say Americans. I should say humans. You're the best humans. Don't let me be egocentric about uh, Americanism. So the other thing is that FEMA goes into things, and again, I'm speaking as a former FEMAite, and that's what we call ourselves. Um, as a former FEMAite, we are trained to not trust what people tell us. They're trying to like shake the government down for extra money. They're trying to get money for something that they don't really, the damages that they didn't really have. Some of the basic things that need to happen is that we just walk into the room assuming you're not a liar. That's the number one thing I want the federal government to do is just assume a disaster victim is telling the truth. Don't make them have photographs of every single inch of everything that's ever been damaged. Just assume they're having a really bad day and they're sitting in front of you telling you the truth that they really truly are devastated. Every day, I hear FEMA ask for more and more proof that it was damaged, and it just doesn't make any sense. The next thing is customer service. I gotta tell you, for as much as Amazon has going wrong with it, as much we love and hate Jeff Bezos, I mean, customer service is really good. Like, I got on chat the other day needing something to be replaced. I didn't even have to talk to a human. It had a little bot that fixed everything. I just clicked, 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 and a magic thing was being rerouted to my house the next day. It was fantastic. Wouldn't it be great if the federal government had like customer service lines? Or you could write, let's, I mean, how easy should that be? Um, hey, I'm having some problems with my disaster recovery. My home is destroyed and I need somewhere to stay tonight and I need that um, disaster recovery spontaneous housing that's supposed to show up five years from now to be here like next week. Where, what number do I call for that? So I want a customer service, like I'm not kidding. This is the kind of thing that I want set up. I demand you set up a customer service line so that you know what's going wrong in things. Change has to happen. Who's with me? Who wants change to happen now? Now, people, now, we don't have all year. We can't take any more time. 
We're gonna, so the little game we're gonna try to do, who knows if this is gonna work, probably not, since we're new urbanists and we're not very apparently tech savvy, except her. So, let's see if we can do this little game. What I want you to do with your phone is you can text this 864-740-4913. And also like write it down, because we're gonna be collecting this, like can we aggregate this, Madeline? Can yes. people throughout the next three days text their demands? Yes, you can. All right, so you can also scan this QR code, right? <laughs> yes. If you desire, see, she knows how all of this stuff works. So if you start texting now, then you allegedly, it's supposed to put all your little demands up here. So why don't y'all throw up and like the more people, if you wanna, ha I like doing hashtags, I hashtag everything, even things that don't make sense. And Madeline's like, that's, you're using it wrong. And it doesn't matter, I like to do it that way. So for me, it's FEMA customer service. Throw up here and text, you know, what your personal demand is, if you have one. Does anybody have any demands? Let's see if it works. Has anybody done one yet? I did one. Did it, did it pop up, Madeline? Can you fix it? I can try. <laughs> 22 year old, go fix the technology. Oh, it's working. Is it? I think so. Did it pop up? It's supposed to like make magic. Oh, maybe I didn't do it. Yeah, yeah let's blame the users. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's your fault. Y'all didn't do it. There it is. Was that you, Patty? No, it wasn't. I love it that it's anonymous. It we want, I thought it was so, like, we want Elsie to stop talking. Um, so, no, I'm not going to stop scaring you because fear is a great motivator. Optimism, not so good. Fear, yeah, you'll get up off your tail and do something. I like to think I have a little bit of happiness in there. Trust, equity, equity, customer service, materials. Allow us to rebuild resiliently, accurate risk maps, building stabilization, clean water. How sad that we have to beg for clean water. Um, equity, yeah, the, this is what I'm talking about. It's not hard to set up a system where we can, we, the federal government overhaulers in this room and the ones that you pull in over the next couple of days, we are going to do this. I am doing it for sure and I would love to have you all drinking and texting and tweeting the federal government to so thoroughly unnerve them that they're like, what is this conference in Oklahoma City and why are they belligerently badgering us? So this is exciting because through, um, wait, Madeline, where's the magic, the little magic square thing that has all my contact information? Um, it's on a past slide. Okay, can you, can you make the past slide thingy come up? So she has, she has a, like a QR code that's magic and has all my social media stuff that magically pops up on your devices. And then I like, you know, can watch all of your search history and like see it. <laughs> like get in there and be like, why are you not motivated to do stuff? What, what's that? Where, where is this going to? Like all of that. Where does it go, Madeline? It's coming up on Biden's uh, live. That's right. It, it, right now, it's just a, we're direct live streaming to the, the White House. Yeah. So what we're doing right now is we are aggregating. Right now, we're aggregating information to make sure that our social media campaign that we'll be launching in the next couple of weeks, that we have it streamlined. We need our messaging clean and crisp, which is why I'm relying on you guys to give me the feedback for the at doers guide. So the doers guide is my, uh, like that's that zine that we're gonna be doing a lot of major social media. I have the ability to get on television for some reason and people will put cameras on me and I get to yell and scare them too. And so um, if you can at doers guide for any of these things, the at doers guide is gonna aggregate into the Twitter sphere, right? Adding, yeah, that's a thing. So if you will, in any of the um, Twitter stuff that you're doing and Facebook, the Facebook is this one, yeah? at Force of Nature. So if you'll tag me, I'm aggregating the information and then we'll be launching out what, like when we go national, when we, we're gonna blast this out nationally with some major, some of the major hashtags um, to put in front of, of course, FEMA. Um, I have, there are people, there are allies inside the government. You know, they're made up, most of FEMA is made up of really wonderful um, Americans that are serving their country to the best of their ability. They are downtrodden, they are frustrated in the system the same as we are, that's why there is no we and they. They are we, and we are all tired of this bullshit, and we are all ready for change. They want to be able to help disaster victims, that's why they got into it, it's why I got into it. And so, um, as we aggregate, um, some of my allies within the system will be like, hey, have you, uh, Joe, have you seen this? This looks problematic. Hey, Kamala, have you, uh, this morning, Mark Clemens is causing quite the problems. 
Uh, maybe we should get her up here in the White House and see if she's got some solutions for us, which by the way, I have a long list of solutions. It's not just about the problems, it's about creating the solutions, right? That's what we're here to do, learn what the solutions are, right? So they're on my website, which you can see, there's a ton of the solutions. There are little tiny videos that I've been trying to do with Steve Mizan for many, many years. We're trying to get me down to talk to him like in two minutes clips, which is never, <laughs> never works. Um, but I just wanted to basically tie it back around to uh, Camille. Um, the reason I wanted Camille to kick us off is because I loved, man, how fun was that panel? It's like all the young people over here on this side of the table. And then all of our founding mothers and fathers. Ah, we appreciate because we are standing on the backs of all of those that have come before us. And if not for the woman at FEMA that trained me to be the policy expert that I am today, the terrorist that I am for the federal government to like make their lives miserable, I relied on an amazing woman within FEMA to make me the powerhouse of ender of their stable, nice internal FEMA thing that they rely on. You know, they, if not for her, I wouldn't be where I am today. And so I think that's what the beauty that's happening with CNU right now is that CNU perpetually pushes this idea of those of us that have been in it, and now I've been in it for 10 years, so I can't even claim to be a newbie anymore. Like now I'm one of the old sad ones that has to be ousted <laughs> off the stage. Um, so I wanted to wrap around with what Camille is doing because the Place Initiative is an organization that is full of young and young at heart, rabble rousers, Patty, that one was most correct of you, um, that we, we want things to change and we're ready to do something about it. Camille showed up at CNU on the Magical Mystery Tour bus and she didn't take any guff from anyone. She was like up in the faces of the people that are like, you don't know what you're talking about, sit down over there. And she's like, I do too. And you're gonna sit down and listen to me. And I was like, yes, girl, go. And so she's been at it ever since. And she doesn't have all the answers, but she's willing to get out there and make something happen. And that's what we're gonna have to do to make change happen now. So I will finish that in saying, let's go get shit done, people, yes. Crying? Do I hear crying in the background? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what do you guys have? Like, what are what are the problems in Europe? Yes, Joel. Yeah. So um, one phenomenal job um, to each of you. Um, going all the way back to the beginning, I was actually really impressed thinking about disaster recovery and the overlay. Um, so Joel, I'm based in Atlanta, a developer. I work. Um, in neighborhoods that have been best to discuss it. Our, my map was the first one that uh, Marcus put up, so that's Atlanta. Um, but I grew up in a neighborhood that had had disaster recovery, and I never had thought of it like that because uh, um, this area, south and west side of Atlanta, was public housing projects. It was on that red line area. Eventually it became, you know, a lot of crime, drugs, all of that kind of stuff in the 80s and 90s. And I think about how even today, Eric Kronberg, who's in this room, knows you can go across and there's a ton of vacant properties, a ton of blighted properties. Like literally, it would look like there was some sort of disaster there, aside from the fact that there are actually some properties standing. And the process by which we've been going about doing it, I've always known was intentionally about neighborhood and community development and people first, but I actually want to take some of you all's methods and, and models in terms of that process, which was, you know, when Steve laid it out, he showed um, it was like, you know, first, you know, you have the disaster, whatever, but then you got to rebuild the community, the culture. Like, it had nothing to do with the buildings first. It's like, you got to reestablish that. And I realized that's what we've been doing, but I didn't really have a context in this professional manner. And so I think that as I look at, once again, neighborhoods that have not suffered through tornadoes and hurricanes, but have suffered through disinvestment, right? for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. Think about what a neighborhood looks like that's been disinvested for 40 years. It's a disaster, mm -hmm. like yeah. literally. Um, and so anyway, thank you so much for you know giving you know some additional context that now I will use, and also of course, connecting me to how to get shit done. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that third party ticket, so I'll be looking for that. Yeah, that's right. you know, that, that candidate. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question for Laura. Introduce yourself. Oh, I'm Bernice uh, Regal, incremental developer from Buffalo, New York. Woo! Also thinking about all of this all the time. Um, but I would say, so I'm curious on timeline, you know, we always talk about we don't have enough time and the tornado hits. 
And I've heard you say this, but I think it's worth to everybody hearing this. Talk through the first seven days in a disaster. You know, the, the, the water, you say like the truck pulls up with the water, yeah. and the, you know, and how, how long do we really have to respond? Because how often, I mean, I can't sleep on the floor for three days, you know, out in the cold. I'm curious. Much less three years. Right, right, exactly. So I, I want to hear more about that. Okay, so the, uh, we, in part of the Magical Mystery Tour, uh, we did a tour of Monty Anderson's work that he's doing in uh, South Dallas. If you do not know who Monty Anderson is, you need to Google him, you need to know him, and you need to figure out how to get to the beautiful, tornadic, flooding land of Texas, the Independent Republic of Texas, um, to come visit and say that's also where I'm working. I'm working in a really small town of uh, 10,000 people. Monty's work is, um, is rapid, and it's fast, and it's moving, and he's doing a lot of things to go with the parking lots and the blighted neighborhoods, and he's working a lot of, and I, I, it's a really complex term saying blighted neighborhoods, I know, but uh, economically disinvested um, areas, and how can we do things in that tactical, lighter, leaner, quicker, cheaper way? The beauty is that disasters is exactly the best of lighter, leaner, quicker, cheaper, but it's where we set up the first thing. So in disaster recovery, the first thing that we need is water, food and talks. That's the first thing that we need. So usually a very well-intentioned person pulls up somewhere, not thinking about the where, in a parking lot, and they start unloading water and, and the, the, just the basics. And the next thing that is, oh, I've got some food. Um, my power is out and I'm gonna bring some food around and I'm gonna, uh, you know, or my power's not out and I'm bringing food and I'm gonna bring some blankets. And so they come to where the guy already set up with the water. So they pop in. And then somebody's like, oh, I've actually got a tent and we can set something up and we can start, uh, Red Cross is gonna be here. So Red Cross pops up next to where the water was. All of a sudden you have a town center, a pop-up town center that has happened in totally the wrong place. So the truth is, sadly, after a disaster, you have like zero time to figure out where your town center needs to be. So this is where we as new urbanists, the greatest thing that we have going for us is that when you end up with a really bad day, and unfortunately, don't cry, it's gonna happen if it hasn't happened already, and it's gonna happen again if it has. So when you end up with a really bad day, you're gonna be much better equipped because you listen to me say, pay attention to where you set up distributing water because that needs to be your town center. It needs to be the parking lot, which should be a town center if it isn't already. It needs to be anchored in the middle of things, in the middle of the disaster zone. And it doesn't make sense because it's dangerous and there's trees down and there are power lines down and FEMA says evacuate, evacuate. Yeah, and I'm sorry, this is where we all are. This is where we are, this is where our homes are, and this is where we're gonna be. So where you set up the water matters to how you incrementally. So then the Red Cross comes in, all of a sudden you've got some tents up. And when we look at all of these places that are impacted by disasters, where do you stay? Because a lot of times the hotels, if you have a hotel in a rural area, you have one and it's probably gone too. So where you set up, wherever it is that you're gonna sleep is important. Where are those tents go up? And there are some people like uh, Katrina Johnston Zimmerman. That's another woman that if you do not know her, you need to know of her, Google her now. She has done a ton of work on um, uh, refugee encampments all over the world, war-torn countries, how they are setting it up to be safer for women and children. Because as soon as things are safe for women and children, they are safe for everyone. And so as you're popping these things up together, the first thing that you do once you get people safe and the water recedes or like the power lines are off the roads, the first thing you need to be thinking is, how can we instantaneously bring food, music, and people together? Food, music, and what in the South we call fellowship. Food, music, and fellowship. That is the most, it is more important than patching a roof. Food, music, and fellowship. Because that is at the core of recovery, of trauma. I need you to hug me more than I need my roof patched. I need you to be with me. And I need to be with you because I know that you know what I'm going through. And we don't have to talk about it. We look into each other's eyes and we know what we're going through. And then somebody picks up a guitar and somebody brings me a plate of food. And every night I know that between four o'clock and eight o'clock, I can hear some music and I can check out at the really crappy time that I'm having. And I can be friends and I can laugh and my kids have other kids to play with because their lives are upended and we need food, 
music, and fellowship. So that is the most important piece. And if you start there, then the rest, the stage and the microphones and FEMA comes in with its paperwork, they will fold <laughs> in around you if you have somewhere for them to fold in. Otherwise, they will choose where you go. They will find something on the outskirts of town, which you and your no car having cell phones that flew away in the tornado, they will want you to log onto your computer, which you do not have on Wi-Fi, which does not exist in power grids that are down, and they will want you to fill out some paperwork. And the thing that you will need is food, music, and fellowship, and probably some alcohol to get you through the day of not being in FEMA today. Right. Is that what you want to be again? What? What? what, 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 what <laughs> okay, so first, Monty Anderson is here and he'll be speaking. And I definitely recommend that you check it out because what he accomplishes is really inspirational. It's really, really great. Uh, the theme song when you put this together during this should be Judy Collins' uh, Bread and Roses. Um, that's a really good song for the concept that you just explained. And the reason I think I love you so much is that you're an activist, you're an advocate, you're not afraid. Of being an anarchist. <laughs> we gotta change the system, people. All right, just real quickly. Steve and Camille. I'm sorry, she can't Steve and Okay. We heard a moment ago about uh, can't sleep, uh, you know, just, just on the floor for three days. Mm -hmm. The people uh, that, that uh, where the place was destroyed by, uh, by Dorian, they've been sleeping out in the woods, unsheltered for almost three years. Yeah. Just no roof up their head, nothing. It's living in the woods. So, I mean, this, this stuff's real. People that, people that started high school, uh, sorry, elementary school uh, after Andrew uh, in a FEMA trailer, a lot of them graduated from high school in that same FEMA trailer. Oh, man. Laura. Camille. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to pass the mic to Baxter Hinken, who has been uh, the project manager for the Climate Receiver Places Project at Place Initiative, so you can speak yeah. uh, to that for about two minutes. Thanks, Camille, and thanks to everyone. Um, so at Place Initiative, which uh, Camille founded and uh, Stephen uh, LC are both part of, um, I manage the Climate Receiver Places Project, which is sort of um, looking at uh, changing disasters with climate change uh, going forward uh, as they increase uh, across the country, across the world, and finding those communities that have lower disaster risk in the future from climate change. And then, um, and then sort of focusing on uh, building up those places in the right way, in, in the new urbanist way, and um, uh, creating a guide to local and regional governance for those places and really setting up those places very proactively for um, climate migration and climate refugees to go to those places in the future so people can escape the, the worst effects of these disasters and the places that they're coming from before more disasters happen to them there. What's the and day and time of your session? Right, the day and time of the session, tomorrow, 2.15, uh, welcoming cities and receiver places. Um, uh, we'll be discussing the project and other things in more detail, and um, if anyone wants to get interested or learn more about the project and place initiative in general, uh, please come to the uh, table uh, outside um, next to Emerging New Urbanists. Thank you, Bastard. Thank it was you. Fantastic. Woo! Woo! Yeah. Yeah. I, just, I just want to share as a Louisianian who deals with a lot of hurricanes. Civic centers and convention centers turn out to be that town center where people go and the Red Cross shows up and we turn those into emergency shelters. So I think those could be better equipped to handle that as a dual purpose. Yeah, absolutely. And there's so uh, you'll hear me talk a lot about this. The reason I, I love the reason I love disasters so much is because there's insane amounts of money. So if your community does not yet have a place that should be the town center and you are look you also are can legitimize uh, describing how you are in a, a, a risk area, which we are all in a risk area. I can help you locate the funding because there is a crap ton of money to build um, these types of facilities, which on the rest of the good days are town centers, by the way. Yep. Hazard mitigation funds. Hazard mitigation grant funds. Uh, I'm a mayor, so I don't actually need the microphone. Uh, but, uh, I'm Jim the mayor of Superior, Wisconsin, which is on the far western end of Lake Superior. Uh, in my lifetime, 
My city has been fully evacuated twice from man-made natural disasters, or man-made disasters. I would say human-made, but there were no women involved in those disasters. Um, uh, uh, we've also been locked up in our homes by week-long storms that shut down transportation, catastrophic floods almost every single year, and we've never received the dime of FEMA funding for any of it. Uh, so I want to follow up the very first question to say if value based the, the loss based formula that FEMA, FEMA requires us to submit to get any kind of uh, relief if that's not the ideal metric and I'm telling you it absolutely is not then then what it's uh, that's I guess my technical point how do we articulate loss when it's not in dollars here's my car and I'll help you get all the money you want <laughs> uh, and and I'll piss FEMA off along the way as I as we did um, so the the um, this goes to back to what Marcus was talking about. So the the numbers are not only not the way to do it. This is where people are like, oh, FEMA's racist. No, the math calculations are racist because we're not looking at calculating value. So think about what you're talking about, which is just like numerically how much damage do you have, not how much impact was there per capita in your community but also look at the way in which you have to calculate the valuation of land and assets to get a federal disaster declaration. So if you have 100 homes hit in one neighborhood that is disinvested and you have an event that hits a wealthy neighborhood, who can know what colors the two fall into for the populations that live within them? Who can say? But one, we'll get a federal disaster declaration because the aggregate of damages calculated equals the threshold for the declaration where the other would not because the aggregate of money necessary to do those repairs is not equal. Now, does that sound very equitable? No, that's one of my doer demands, but this is crap. It should be about, so my town is 10,000. We were the largest impacted community per capita after Harvey, per person population percentage, over half of our homes were impacted by floodwaters. So yes, were there hundreds of thousands of people in Houston impacted? Sure, but they got somewhere to go, there were hotels to go, and I'm not saying that their lives were great right after the disaster. Half of ours were, we had nowhere to go. There's no hotel, where are we driving? Hours away, in what vehicle? So like, you're right, and that is one of the doer's demands. One of the doer's demands, there's a whole list of them that we're gonna, so we're actively in the midst of updating the website with the doer's demands, so that would be you promoting the electeds getting involved with the public assistance overhaul is critical. So I told you guys that the houses were only 10%, that's individual assistance, public assistance is the other piece, which you're talking about, which is the municipal governments and the private nonprofits. <laughs> but when you come to the redlining session and talk more to Marcus about what he's talking about, again, you're right. All I can say is you're right, and the system is broken, and that's what the doer's demand is about. Any closing comments from anybody else? Otherwise, there are plenty of opportunities to talk to our panelists, who are all brilliant, as well as for us to introduce you to other brilliant people, which we know and love, that can also help you figure out how to use the new urbanist tools to do place recovery in your area. All right, y'all have a great night.